Good evening and welcome to the launch of the Molecular Diagnostic Innovation Partnership. My name is Philip Beer and I am OncoDNA's UK Medical Director. With me in the room at a suitable distance is Carol Sikora from Rutherford. We're also joined by Danny Bell from Macmillan and Albert Forsey from Aviva. Albert unfortunately will only be joining us by voice, we won't be able to, to see him but we're looking forward this evening to an interesting and lively discussion. I will ask the panelists to introduce themselves in more detail in a couple of minutes, but first a few words of introduction. So the reason we're launching this initiative is because we are at a pivot point in biomarker and the use of biomarkers, particularly genomic biomarkers in cancer. 
we have accumulated a large amount of information over the last few years around biomarkers. And there have been some great successes in linking biomarkers with specific therapies. For example, EGFR inhibitors in lung cancer. But we also have a long way to go. We have issues where we don't know how to use the best therapy. And a good example of this is immunotherapy in cancer, which is transformative for the minority of patients who get a sustained response. But unfortunately for the majority of people, they don't get a response. And we don't yet have the biomarkers to identify those patients who are going to respond and those patients who aren't going to respond. So this is all about bringing people together to make progress. And we are at an interesting time in genomics with a number of big, high-profile international initiatives, such as the Genomic Medicine Service in England, the Health 2030 initiative in Switzerland, and the personalized oncogenomics program in Western Canada. All of these initiatives looking to embed genomics into routine oncology practice. Now, although ambitious, what these, what these projects have in common is that they're very technology focused and they're really predicated on the, idea, on the idea that the introduction of the technology will drive its own uptake. Now, we are aware that the barriers to uptake are more diverse than that. They're more complex. And this is what we're here to talk about this evening. And this is what the Molecular Diagnostic Innovation Partnership has been established for. We want to understand more the operational barriers to uptake of biomarker testing, the intellectual barriers, the educational barriers. We're interested in who should be tested, when should they be tested in the patient journey, how can we best use the information, how can we empower those living with cancer to, to use the, the information from genomics as is most appropriate for them to get them onto clinical trials, to get them in control of their own uh, cancer pathway. So what we understand is that the, that the barriers to uptake of biomarker therapy in cancer are complex and they cr cut across multiple disciplines. And that's why we have representation of multiple disciplines here this evening. So we'll start with a round of introductions. I'll, I'll kick off, lead from the front. So. I am a haematologist by initial training, a physician scientist, although I've been working in solid tumor genomics for the last six years or so. My interests are in drug development and using biomarkers in clinical trials. And it's all about getting the best drugs developed and then finding the best patients who are gonna benefit for them. So with that, I will hand over to Dani Bell from Macmillan to give us a, an introduction. Hi, um, I'm Dani and I'm a strategic advisor at Macmillan. Um, my thematic area is treatment, medicines and genomics. I'm a nurse by background and I worked in the NHS for many, many years. Uh, 28 of those were in cancer care. And obviously I'm here um, uh, from a patient perspective. I think it's really, really important. Um, the conversations uh, that I had around um, genomics and biomarkers uh, with patients and therefore we need a skilled workforce to be able to have those conversations. Uh, thank you, Dani. Albert. Thanks, um, Philip, and uh, apologies all um, that my webcam is uh, not working this evening. Um, so as Philip said, I'm Albert Fawzi. I've um, been at Aviva for um, over two years now. I joined on their uh, global leadership programme um, and I'm the clinical governance manager in our uh, UK um, health business, so private medical insurance um, business. My, my background at university is in uh, biomedicine and uh, my master's is in uh, biotechnology and business. So I'm particularly uh, interested in the, the, uh, the overlap between um, health and, and business and um, particularly in, uh, in uh, pr precision um, uh, molecular biology. Cool. Thank you, Albert. And Carol. So I'm, I'm a professor of oncology at Imperial for many, many years. I've been a consultant for 40 years and uh, fascinated by this area of predictive medicine, trying to right patient, right drug, right time, the usual cliche, but it's true. And what's happened over the last two decades is we've got the enabling technology. We've got artificial intelligence, we've got big data, big computers and genomics. In, on a scale that we've never had before. 
So surely now is the time to bring genomics and other biomarkers straight into a holistic view of cancer in a totally different way. Thank you. So I'd like to open the discussions this evening with a, with a fairly broad topic, and I'll ask you to kick it off, if that's all right, Carol, around who should we be testing? Which patient population should have access to biomarker analysis, genomics, and, uh, and other types of biomarkers? So the obvious answer to that question is everybody, because really we have to understand if we're going to collect the data, who will benefit? In reality, who benefits most? Probably people with metastatic cancer. They would be the first mm. people I would go to because they may have had two or three rounds of different chemotherapies, different systemic therapies. They're not responding. They have the biggest vested interest in getting a result. Now, they're the poorest end of the spectrum, of course. What we really need is to bring it back right to the beginning of cancer diagnosis, to plan adjuvant therapy, all of it, through surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, with genomics in mind, with biomarkers in mind, and learn from how we unravel that. So at one end, you've got a service provision, provision for people with metastatic cancer. At the other end, you've got an exploratory project to work out the best treatment for the best patient, and to get all that information, and to curate it in a way that we didn't, simply didn't have the, co the computer power uh, when I started as a trainee, there was nothing. And so now we have the potential to do it in a totally different scale, not just for cancer, but a whole range of diseases. But with cancer, it's important to integrate individual treatment plans with the, the basic biomarker signatures of responses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, you touch on an interesting area there around data. And from the scientific perspective, I think there was a feeling when we in, in embarked on this project of sequencing large numbers of cancers that the genomic information itself would reveal the truth. And I think what we've begun to realize is that it's more complex than that. And a key piece of information we need to have is, is of course, the patient, is the phenotype of the patient, their response to the drugs as they move through the pathway and map all this together with the, with the genomics. So, so it is a big enterprise, but I completely agree that the answer is to look at everybody and, and to learn while we're doing it. Um, I'm going to ask you to, to comment on that, Albert, from an, in, an insurance point of view. So it, it's, it's easy for us as clinicians and scientists to say, yes, we would love to look at everybody. We, would, we can learn from this kind of profiling. But what sort of information would you want to see as an, in, as an insurer to convince you that this was value for money? Yeah, that, that, that's the kind of the, the key point, Philip. Um, and as um, Carol mentioned, I, I think that the, the closer um, you can get the biomarker testing to uh, to patients that aren't at the, the metastatic phase, the more value there is in getting them, you know, to the most effective treatment faster. Uh, and from the insurance point of view, that makes kind of pure um, sense as a as a business case. You, you could almost look. And, uh, and, and I'm sure many do look at the individual tests as um, what do they represent themselves as, as a business case. Um, you know, could, can, can you get someone better and, and well quicker um, and, and avoid the cost as a, as a, as a payer um, of, of having those people um, in hospital and undergoing treatment? Um, and as well, a really interesting um, area which, which I think um, has a lot more um, kind of room to uh, to be investigated is um, what kind of adju adjuvant therapies can be avoided. Uh, can you avoid um, certain chemotherapies with, with their associated side effects um, if you can understand more about um, someone's disease and someone's tumour and whether, for example, surgery might be enough with, without the um, without the additional additional chemotherapy. But but certainly um, from a kind of a, a quality. Um, a quality of life piece and um, and the business case um, of those individual tests um, for, for varying populations um, is kind of the key evidence what what, um, what insurers would look for to, to fund these tests. Mm, thank you, Albert. That 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 is an interesting point that you touch on there. That there is sometimes a perception that, that genomics will find new therapies, which is good, will find therapies that are perhaps not approved in that cancer type, which 
can create problems with, with paying for medicines. But of course, there is great utility potentially in identifying treatments that don't work and therefore the ability to save money from not giving an effective therapy and to actually save those living with cancer from undergoing therapy that, that is not going to be beneficial for them. Um, Dani, can I hand the, the, the topic over to you to give us your insights both from a nursing perspective but also from the, from the patient perspective? I guess from the nursing perspective, um, I, I absolutely see that the um, particularly the clinical nurse specialists that work in cancer care have a really pivotal role um, in uh, uh, kind of genomics and um, uh, they're going to need upskilling um, and they're going to need to think about how they embed uh, genomics um, within uh, the kind of workflows and cancer pathways with their clinical teams. But, you know, they, they perhaps need different skills, so potentially some light touch um, genomic counselling skills. Um, uh, and, mm -hmm. and readiness of that workforce is going to be quite key um, uh, in how genomics ro rolls out with the genomic medicine service. So I think I think nurses per se across all specialties have have a role to play, but I think in cancer care particularly, um, uh, clinical nurse specialists have a role to play. And from the patient's perspective, I think. Um, it's, it's going to be really, really key that they can understand information and make good choices um, uh, and, and actually having information around genomics uh, presented to them in a way that they can um, undertake shared decision making is really important and again I think the clinical nurse specialists play a pivotal role in that. Um, you know, if we're, if we're going to embrace all of the things that um, Carol said about the, the kind of um, the opportunities here in not, you know, and uh, you know, in, in the technology, also not putting patients through uh, treatments, managing the expectation is going to be key. And again, I think that nurses are going to play a key role in that because, as you say, not not everyone will benefit, um, and it may not be the first line treatment. Um, uh, you know, and they may still go through standard treatment. So I think managing the expectation and accurate, understandable information is going to be absolutely key to support shared decision making. Hmm. Yes, that is interesting. For how much are the clinical nurse specialists, Amy, involved in genomics at the moment as, as things stand? I think in some areas they are, I mean, because obviously we had in England, we had the 100,000 Genomes Project, and there obviously is now a genomic medicine strategy, um, and there is activity in some of the devolved nations as well uh, in, in the UK. So some of them obviously um, have a, no a knowledge, and they were upskilled as genomic practitioners, but it's fair to say that's not a large number. Um, and there, there are many um, clinical nurse specialists, but there is, an, there is definitely an appetite there. They, they, un, they understand, um, uh, you know, that they need to understand about genomics and what it means for them and their roles. And so, um, you know, I think um, I don't think it will be difficult to engage them. I think it's a yeah. difficult time at the moment because there are lots of uh, external pressures on their kind of um, work. But um, yeah, so I do, I do think there is a support of nurse specialists out there that um, that already have a good level of knowledge and are practicing at a high level in this area because we have the 100,000 Genomes Project. Mm -hmm. And I just want to pick up on one other comment that you made, Dani, about the genetic counselling. And we have, a therapies, we have therapies approved now based on germline genomic biomarkers on uh, inherited BRCA mutations, for example. And now that we have these drugs approved and we know that they are effective, we're in a situation where we are going to have to be screening patients for mutations. And we probably don't have the resources in the conventional med medical genetics pathways to support this. So that is something that has certainly been raised in that we can use the skills of the clinical nurse specialists to be involved in the genetic counseling stage in order to make this feasible, in order that everybody who's, who can potentially benefit from drugs like PARP inhibitors are able to get access to testing. Do you see that that's something that is, that is feasible then? The, I guess from two aspects, two angles. Are the, uh, do you think the staff, the nurse specialists, will be willing to take this on? And more importantly, perhaps, do they have the bandwidth with all of the other responsibilities to take these roles on as well? 
think they're really, really uh, good questions. Um, I think it's fair to say that the um, clinical nurse specialist workforce are stretched, um, and um, you know, and and it's quite possible that we would have to rethink um, how this this works in their job plans, and therefore we need to engage lead cancer nurses um, and. Um, think about uh, what their role is in this. So it's not just the case of upskilling the nurse specialist. I think there needs to be some, some leadership in this. And there obviously is within the genomic medicine um, uh, service uh, infrastructure, they, they have a devolved leadership infrastructure, I think, which would really, really support this. And they are looking at workforce transformation. And I think clinical nurse specialists will be one, one area. I think there are other roles like practice nurses that again can play uh, a, a really good good role earlier on in family history taking and all sorts of other things. So I think there are skills already there. It's it's how they're used and how you you free up that role. So so it's not just an add on. So one of the things we do at Macmillan is we we look at the shape and the size of the workforce and we understand where the gaps are in the CNS workforce and we know we will never build them much the same as to, uh, genetic counsellors. So we have to think about skill mix teams. You know what what do people with cancer need along the pathway and at different touch points and who can deliver that so that the right roles deliver the right care and support. Um, so therefore we can just rethink um, you know, what's pivotal for clinical nurse specialists to do so that we can kind of embed it in their work plans. Mm. Now, thank you. We, we've moved quite nicely into the, the second topic that I had in mind for this evening, and that was to talk about some of the barriers to embedding biomarker testing into routine oncology practice. Uh, I'm going to ask Albert to, to give us some thoughts on that from the insurance perspective. Uh, before I hand over to Albert, I will just say that we are taking questions that you can put in, in the chat function. They are being collated in the room. And we hope to have some time at the end of the session to, to pick up on some of the questions from the audience that we can ask the panelists to comment on. So, Albert, can you share with us some of your thoughts about barriers that you see to the introduction of biomarker testing in a more widespread way in cancer? Yeah, de definitely. I think um, a, a key one, what we're seeing at Viva anyway, is when um, specialists uh, request um, for these tests to, to take place. We're, we're not seeing a uniform um, uniform request from, from specialists across the country. So what we do see is some uh, consultants have their preferred test and uh, I, I guess kind of have a good understanding of what the data is that comes out of them. And that then allows them to, to make a decision on the diagnosis or, or subsequent treatment pathway. So I, I think a key barrier certainly is um, it, it is how um, how kind of widespread um, the, the, the the tests are that would be um, requested that would come into us. But that that's that, that's definitely one. I think um, as I mentioned earlier, kind of cost and, and business case is um, is probably secondary to that actually. If um, the, uh, 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 certainly one 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 or, or um, a, a couple of the questions that would be at the forefront of, of insurers' minds are, um, is the outcome of doing this test, will that um, either confirm a diagnosis or uh, change or confirm a, a treatment pathway? If, if, if the, the specialist can't answer those two questions with, um, with, with the outcome of the test, um, then I think um, payers will, will um, become um, nervous of, of uh, kind of um, Funding these kinds of tests, and uh, and yeah, that there would that, that would again kind of increase the the, the barriers that are there. Hmm. Yes, and it, it, that is in itself, I think, a little bit difficult in that some of this information is currently lacking. That, as mentioned earlier, we have a lot of information about the genomic events that drive cancer, but we're yet to really understand how they influence the response to therapy. And uh, that is a, an open and important question in terms of how we actually get that information. Um, Carol, could I pass the question over to you from a, a clinical and scientific perspective? Where, where do you think the current barriers are in improving uptake? I think part of the problem is financial and part of it is the difficulty in oppressed systems, the NHS and all healthcare systems oppressed at the moment, uh, uh, having the time to go through it all. 
the main driver for this sort of uh, analysis is actually the patient and their families. They understand that there may be drugs, and that's why we go back to metastatic cancer again, where they're up against it. The patient's reached the end of the road, and they've been told there's nothing more conventional. They ask about clinical trials, and they say, are there any drugs that could target? Are there any? I've actually had a patient say to me, are there actionable mutations in my cancer? So once you get that, that drives the here and now. But the longer term has got to be a much more holistic project where you take everybody and you follow them through and you look at the results and you compare the genome, their normal genome, with their cancer genome and, and look for heterogeneity and all the rest of it. I think the next 10 years are going to see a, a huge ex explosion in the, the, the amount of data driven by the reduction in cost of doing the various assays required. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been doing, looking for biomarkers since I was a registrar. The estrogen receptor in breast cancer was the first one I remember. And that is so simple. You give tamoxifen, which was the drug of the 70s, so when I was a registrar, to patients that had estrogen receptor. Uh, you didn't if they didn't have the estrogen receptor, but immunohistology. And so, it, it's just really an expansion of a natural progression. Then her 2 new and her septin came on. So people understand the concept of biomarkers. What we've got now is a system that allows a much more holistic exploration of the cancer and collection of huge amounts of biodata that can be used not just for the individual patient, but for patients in the future. And it's important to collect that. So moving away from an individual patient-centered can, how will this help me? More how it will help the whole body of cancer patients in the future. And uh, the question is, how much do you have to measure? What do you have to measure? Costs are coming down, but it does cost. And so for the insurance company, uh, you know, whether it's the private insurance or public insurance through the NHS, someone's got to pay the bill. Now, we've already heard there may be savings in all this. There's no, if you have an expensive drug, and it only works in 10% of the population, and you give it to all the population, you're wasting 90% of the costs of that drug. So having a test that predicts which 10% with some certainty makes such good sense. So it can, in fact, reduce costs. Pharma industry, sometimes they're not too interested in segregating the market. There's no doubt. They'd rather you gave the drug to 100% than the 10% that respond, because it's better for their sales. But I think everyone recognizes, pharma as well, that understanding the ta targeted drugs, understanding the mechanism behind them is going to be the way forward. And increasingly, uh, patients love it. They, they love the concept. It makes such logical sense. I mean, it's almost like those antibiotic testing kits you have in path labs for bacteriology. So you look for the mm -hmm. sensitivity of the bacteria. This is just a, a, a much more grander scheme to d identify which cancers respond to which drugs. So it, it's got to be the way forward. We know that. It's just when's the time right for it? And I think the time is now. In the next five to ten years, we're going to see an explosion. And the costs will come right down, and the data will be massed, and the insurance companies will love it. The cancer nurses will love it because they'll be able to have a, a story that makes sense to tell the patients. At the moment, what we tell patients is a little bit of a, we don't really know how these drugs work that we have, you know, if we're honest. We don't know how platinum works, we don't know how paclitaxel works, we think we do. But when you look at the medical student lectures and you look at the reality of our knowledge, we're, op we're talking op way beyond our real knowledge of how the drugs work. But with the new set of drugs, we should be able to close the loop between the diagnostic and the therapeutic. And I think that's what this will bring. Mm. So the academic world has contributed enormously in the understanding of, of the genomics, but may, they may not be best placed in pulling the, the, this clinical information together. So I, I guess a key question then is, is how is this going to happen? Who's going to fund it? Does it happen within the healthcare system? 
it has to. It has to fund. It has to be funded as a, a normal, t not as a research or an academic tool, but as a routine tool for, for use by, by patients in the system. And compared with the total cost of cancer care today, with all the therapeutic options in all the four main cancers and many of the other ones, there's no doubt that the cost is trivial compared with the total care package being offered to patients. And so, uh, it strikes me that it has to come from that. Obviously, there are academic studies. You know, there are, there are academic studies that suggest you know, there the are believers that think heterogeneity is the enemy of all this, it'll kill it all, that multiple metastases all have different evolutionary roots, Darwinian evolution, and you'll get different patterns. I don't believe that. I think there's going to be commonality. There will be some. There will be some metastases that will be different. But once we learn the rules, we'll work everything out. It's all got to come from the aberrant DNA in a cancer. So we mm. will be able to work it out. You have to have faith that we can do that. And of course, there are epiphenomena, there's epigenetics and so on. But you know, on the basic basis of malignancy is in the changes in DNA in the cancer cell. And if we can follow the pathway down, we should have the solution to better therapies. Mm. Well, thank you. Um, Dani, I'd like to ask you to comment on something that, that Carol just said a couple of moments ago around the uh, uh, patients asking their physicians, have I got any actionable mutations? And, and that, that shows a, a, a knowledge and comfortable, uh, to someone comfortable with genomics that I think must be quite unusual at the moment. Um, Dani, do you see that as the, the future? Do you think that's the way forward? I think so. I mean, I think we are already seeing it in areas like uh, BRCA, for instance. You know, if you talk to some um, gynaecology nurse specialists, they will say that some of their patients become more informed than they are um, and ask, you know, all the right questions. So I think because we've had the 100,000 Genomes Project, because uh, there is a level of understanding out there, I think there is variation and there will be variation by tumour type, but we will get to a point where that becomes the norm and they will be asking those sorts of questions. I mean, I think we have to remember about health literacy, um, you know, so these are possibly people that, you know, are able to um, look online and extract good information and we don't have the same level of health literacy across all patients. So that's why it's really important to have the, the, the skilled workforce so that they can actually, um, you know, uh, kind of address the patient's questions or give them the information at the level that's right right for them. Um, some people don't know, want to know that detail, so there's a choice element in there. But yes, I do think that that um, uh, is something we will see more of in, in the future. Hmm. Thank you. Um, Albert, I'd like to come over to you with, with something else that Carol commented on, the idea of building these big data sets that help us better understand how patients respond to, to therapy so that we can give people the right therapy, but also potentially so we can save money through not giving an effective therapy. Do you see that as something that the insurance companies could take on as a project? I mean, it's, it's expensive and needs a, a lot of vision. It's gonna take a while to build these kind of data, but essentially there are benefits there for the, for the payers as well. So what, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, de definitely. That's a, it's a really interesting um, thought, Philip. Um, I, I mean, it's certainly not beyond the, the realms of possibility um, with the, the kind of the, the, the four main uh, private medical insurers in, in the UK. Um, they, they, they've worked together in the past, and I'm, I'm sure you know we could work together in, in the future to, to put something together like that. Um, and, and, and I think the, the large amounts of data that, that you mentioned. Um, is really interesting as well, and uh, I, I'm not sure if it's the right time now, but I wanted to throw it back to Carol and, and say, is, is there kind of a risk for um, confusion among um, oncologists with, with, with all the data, and you know, would um, one oncologist, given um, the, the same patient, request, request a specific biomarker test, and another one wouldn't and would go down a different treatment pathway? I, I think, if I may, 
Uh, the, the great thing is it's a very good point that you're raising, Albert. I, I think what we've got to have is a standard batteries. That's the only way forward. It's just as cheap to have multiple assays going on. Once you've got the sample, it's been curated, it's been pr processed. Doing many assays is as is, is cheap as doing one. So rather than request from a, a list of things which ones you want, you just do the whole lot and the computer reads it out and gives you a printout that's understandable uh, to everybody. And I think doing it on a large scale, I mean, doing it in every patient in a clinic seems a good way forward if you can find the funding to it. And which ones you use? Obviously, OncoDNA is one system. There are several systems out there. Do you need to do whole genome sequencing? Do you actually need to sequence the whole genome in every patient? Uh, and how do you access the DNA? Do you get it from the primary sample? Well, it may be in paraffin block material, but you can get around that. Can you get circulating DNA? Or can you get even beyond that salivary DNA? There's all sorts of possibilities for the future, undeveloped at the moment. But I think there's enough proof of concept that it's really worth developing this whole area to get better therapies for cancer. Because otherwise, we're going to amass new and new, newer, more and more newer therapies and not really understand how to use them, except by doing clinical trials that take time, effort, and are not very helpful to those patients that are in the wrong arm of the trial, that are not getting the benefit from the trial. Mm. Uh, Albert, do you see that as an issue then, the, the lack of standardization and, and harmonization in the use of biomarkers? At the moment, yes. Um, uh, I, I believe the, the approach we take at the review from across the industry, but when a biomarker um, test comes in, uh, one that we haven't funded before. It's uh, evaluated by our experiments and treatment panel that, that evaluate, as, as it would suggest, all the other kind of experimental um, treatments that we would have requested for, i.e. that isn't uh, kind of the, the, the go-to um, NHS therapy. Uh, so but because of this, we, um, you know, we, we, we don't see that uniform um, requests from uh, specialists that say, it, I, I've got a patient with, with this particular cancer and, and therefore I'm requesting this biomarker test. We, we've not got to that um, uh, level of kind of um, regularity yet, uh, which I, I think would, would be really helpful for payers and, um, and yeah, insurers as a whole, they can start to build their own um, data and, and become a lot more comfortable um, funding these tests, uh, especially knowing the, uh, the patient outcome at, at the other side as well. Hmm. I, I think Carol's solution is an elegant one, essentially to offer broad, to, to test everything and everyone. Then you don't really need to make those kind of decisions. And a, a broad biomarker test for everyone with advanced cancer and eventually maybe everyone diagnosed with cancer does seem to be the direction of travel. And that actually moves into the, to the last major topic for this evening, and that's clinical trials. And the reason for, for testing biomarkers close to the point of diagnosis is, of course, to identify where there are approved therapies. But there's also a, a great wealth of information that can be discovered around clinical trials. And we've seen year on year approvals, increased approvals of new cancer drugs that are associated with a biomarker, a recommended or mandated biomarker. At the end of 2019, we're up to 70 different oncology approvals for biomarker associated therapies. So we're gathering between five and 10 new drugs a year. And in parallel with that, oncology clinical trials are increasingly biomarker stratified. And at the moment, we're sitting at around 40% of oncology trials are biomarker stratified. So this, this then is a great utility for biomarker testing, is to identify clinical trials. The problem is at the moment, or I would see it as a problem, I'm going to ask Danny, Danny sorry, to comment in a second, uh, is that only about 5% of patients with cancer actually get onto a clinical trial. Uh, and that feels quite low, both from a, a patient perspective, but we'll ask Danny to, to give some thoughts on that, but is also, of course, s 
a low from a drug development perspective in that it just takes a long time to bring new drugs through to market. And actually a reasonable proportion of clinical trials are never completed because they can't recruit enough patients. So, uh, Dani, can we hand over to you for some thoughts on clinical trials from, from the patient perspective? How do patients view clinical trials? Are they a good thing? Are they something that people generally want to take part in? I think um, it, the interesting thing here is that, you know, what we hear from patients is they, they are obviously keen to explore treatments. And if they uh, have a rarer cancer where there are, are limited new treatments, then absolutely uh, they would probably be more interested um, in a clinical trial. I think, I mean, I, when, when I worked in um, cancer services, I used to manage a clinical trials team and actually there were some uh, capacity issues um, around clinical trials. And it wasn't necessarily the fact that um, patients didn't want to come forward. Um, you know, there was, uh, you know, a capping and, you know, and sometimes you couldn't uh, run all the trials you wanted to run because you just didn't have the, the, the capacity in the, in the reach search team to do that. I mean, obviously in big centres, big research centres, they have more capacity. We were, we were a large surgical centre linked to a large oncology centre, but, we, you know, we, we were always exploring across all of the cancer multidisciplinary teams how we improve trial recruitment. So I don't think it, I don't think it's necessarily just from a patient perspective um, the, the low recruitment. I think there is something about our processes and how we engage. And I know there's been a lot of work, um, well not a lot of work, there's been, I've been involved in lots of conversations with different organisations about how you increase um, uh, cancer patient participation in clinical trials. And I think that you know, we, we really need to understand the root of the problem and think about our processes and how we better engage with people, uh, as well as thinking about the fact that we, we probably have a stretched workforce there as well. Mm. Thank you. We, we've had a question come in actually, Dani. Someone has asked us, why don't patients get sight of clinical trials? So, so that implies that if for at least a, a proportion of those people living with cancer don't ever have that kind of discussion. One of the questions that um, is on the um, National Cancer uh, Patient Experience Survey um, to kind of try to understand really whether people get um, asked the question, uh, would you be interested in participating in a clinical trial? And we know that that kind of percentage hasn't really increased um, uh, since the, uh, the start of the, the, the survey. And I think, um, it, again, it, it goes back to my question around whether a suitable trial is open. A lot, of, a lot of what I find, I have found when I've been working with research uh, nurses and also nurse specialists around clinical trials, a lot of people don't want to travel. If you think about the cancer population, the majority of it is older. If there's not a, a clinical trial that's local, um, then that you know, I think they're gonna be less interested. Um, uh, you know, especially if they're, they're in the, the, the group that uh, Carol's um, uh, referred to earlier, which is where they have incurable cancer. Um, and then they really have to ask themselves the question, if, they, if they're a certain age, you know, do I want to travel miles to participate in a clinical trial or do I, or do I want quality of life? And I think there are, this is a really uh, multidimensional issue. I don't think there's a single answer to that, that question. I think that it's, it's multidimensional. And I think we do have to really think about it because, um, you know, you're right, with, with where technology is going and with the opportunities, we do really need to think about how we can engage cancer patients better um, uh, in available uh, trials that are, you know, are reasonably local. Mm. Yeah, thank you. That, that, that is interesting, I think, to hear your context for that, Dani, that this is a, a multi-level, multi-discipline issue, that there's no single problem here, uh, and that there may well be resource constraints. Um, Carol, can I ask you to comment on that from a, from a clinical perspective, whether there are barriers in terms of getting, of getting patients' information about clinical trials and potentially enrolling? I think it's time. I mean, what the NHS is very precious about is the time available to an individual patient. And there's no doubt, you know, when I, when I, and certain places are much busier than others. Uh, obviously, busy general hospitals tend to be the place where clinical trials are not mentioned unless the system can be really slick 
and it's exactly the same with genomic testing. Can it be done really slickly? So the consultant it doesn't have to cause any delay in the clinic, doesn't have to fill any forms, it's all done automatically in a sense, and that's the way to get things done. And enrollment in clinical trials, if, if, if we had better IT systems within the NHS with electronic patient record, which will come, then patients can be identified, they can be made the offering, and, and then the consultant can be told, this patient is flagged up as being suitable for a clinical trial that requires a genomic marker. We recommend a complete genomic screen, and out comes the, the printout. I mean, things will get better with time. Um, there's no doubt that the one force that I've seen the biggest change is patient power, and patients will drive this. They'll seek out places where they can actually get onto clinical trials, and not just for mm. desperate situations such as untreatable metastatic disease when they're being given the end of life type scenario, but rather right at the beginning, they'll want to seek out. I mean, you know, when I started, we didn't tell people they had cancer. Amazing to think, first year as a consultant, you're not telling people they had cancer. And you, you end up not retired yet, but uh, towards the end of my career, I guess. And, uh, you know, we have very frank discussions and uh, in a totally different way about all the options. So I think the future is going to be a very different one. And this type of technology uh, and, and, uh, is, is going to be very much part of the, of the future. Mm. Uh, Albert, can I ask you to come in on this issue and, and give us your perspective in terms of how clinical trials fit in from uh, an insurance point of view uh, and, and how you would see your role in, in supporting patients getting access to clinical trials? Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite hands off at the moment, um, Philip, to be honest. Um, we, we do um, see customers that um, ask us if they can be involved in, in the clinical trial. Um, again, the, the process goes to the uh, experimental treatment panel that I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, it, it's all done, of course, on a, a case by case basis, um, as it's typically uh, kind of very, very complex. So. Um, so that's the, the, the level of, um, of kind of assurance we like to put on it. Um, but, but apart from that, we, we, we kind of look at it from a customer's point of view and the, the only restrictions would be if it was, um, if, if the evidence pointed at looking like it was um, not, not effective or, or going, to make the, going to make the patient worse. So um, aside from that, that, there aren't any restrictions, but um, from a, a private medical insurance point of view, um, that the patient would receive their uh, hospital, hospital cash benefit um, that, that most policies have. So but from a PMI point of view, um, it's, it's very hands off. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Danny, where do you see the role of uh, uh, the patient empowerment that Carol suggested that that could be a big driving force? Would you, would you agree with that? What's your perspective? Thank you. It, it, following on from this, uh, I'm just going to go back to, to splice in some questions. Uh, somebody, uh, Carol, has, has liked your comment about access to large panels for, for all patients, for all those with cancer, uh, and has asked what we can do as a group to, to help that happen, to make that a reality. The first thing is tissue collection, but already tissue collection is quite s sorted out. Uh, ideally, paraffin block material because it's so easy to get retrospectively from all over the world and it's stored and it's safe to send and so on. Fresh tissue has its difficulties in terms of collection. Uh, mm. 
the whole business of circulating DNA and circulating tumor cells is another area of great interest. But, but going forward, it is all about collecting all the data we can and funding it. You know, the, the 100,000 Genome Project is totally blue sky to do that. And it was done in Britain, the Icelandic project, DNA project, again, mm -hmm. collecting all that data. And then takes time for the data to mature. And you have to wait. You have to collect the events that are associated with these projects. And then uh, the same with the cancer projects. You've got to take time to see how it all pans out. In the immediate future, uh, the biggest gains are almost certainly actionable mutations and looking for responses, but there's probably less than 10% of patients. The, the large studies in the States and the Shiva study in France suggest less than 10% of patients have actionable mutations that change the course of their therapy. And that's the difficulty. Uh, and then the difficulty, of course, for the insurers, you're going to propose to them, you're going to use an off-label drug that they're not, in, they're not necessarily willing to fund. A lot of new cancer drugs are now in the £10,000 a month range just for a box of pills. Mm. And this is uh, beyond any concept of health economics that you can really fund this sort of stuff. And, you know, the most expensive combinations are immunotherapy with targeted kinase inhibitors. And the total cost can be up to three or four hundred thousand pounds a year. So I can see, uh, you know, Albert's probably fallen off his chair back there with the, th the thought of that for an insurer. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a problem. We've all got to share the problem. As we accumulate more information, the problem will go away because you'll actually balance the whole books at the end of the day and have a much more effective therapeutic armamentarium by the end of it. But it'll take time. There'll be a hurdle to get through. Mm. Well, I, I might ask uh, uh, Albert to come in, actually, in relation to what you said, Carol, but also in relation to a question that we've had to, to come in. Uh, and one of the audience has asked, that how can we do more to build the evidence case for doing more biomarker testing here in the UK? So what, what do you think, Albert? What kind of evidence do we need and how are we actually going to do that in order that you're not falling off your chair with these <laughs> drug costs that are only increasing over time? Uh, that's very true. It's, uh, I think it's something like a 15% uh, compound annual um, growth rate that, um, that um, hospital uh, costs or healthcare costs seems to incre increase by. Um, but that's, that's not only a, an issue for Aviva, of course, it's um, an issue for um, our, our customers, both uh, individuals and, and, uh, and corporates as well, that um, aren't, um, are, 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 you know, are looking to, to save money in ever. Um, and, and ever pressured financial environments. Um, so, so saving money, I think, is, is key across the whole um, the whole health sphere. On, on Carol's point of um, of reducing the cost of the group, um, I, I, I mean that kind of fits in um, uh, as a fundamental point of insurance. Of course, um, uh, policies are, are grouped together, and unfortunately, uh, some people get ill and have the claim on them. Um, but but those, of course, are, are paid by. Um, paid for by, the, by those that stay well. So um, if, uh, if us as a society can, conti can uh, continue to improve um, and, and go on an upward trend of staying well, um, then that, that's only a good thing for, um, for, for, for making uh, insurance um, affordable, uh, but, but also you know, the, 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 the group as a whole. Uh, what, what, yeah, what, what can be done more to, to evidence that? Um, I, I think it does have to come from, as, um, as Damien said earlier, um, the, 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 the customer first, um, because that, that leads to a, a, a competitive advantage, obviously, but between insurers. If, if Aviva are, um, are kind of more on point at, at funding biomarker testing, then, then that will lead to a competitive, competitive advantage for sure. So it, it does come from a customer um, viewpoint as well. But, but also, as I mentioned earlier, um, a, a consultant um, and a business case view as well. So if, uh, if, if a consultant can, can come to us and, and say, um, you know, the, 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 the results of this biomarker test are either going to be A or B. If it's A, I'm going to go down this treatment pathway. If it's B, I'm going to go down this treatment pathway. And, and both ways um, avoid a, an unnecessary um, course of treatment. 
um, then, then then that is, is a business case in itself. So I, I, I hope that answers your question. It was a bit long-winded um, answer, so I apologise, but um, I, I hope that goes a long way to answering it, Philip. No, that makes sense. Hmm. Um, switching back to clinical trials, uh, uh, Dani, a question has come in that I'm going to ask you to comment on that the, the NHS have been exploring how to use digital media to raise awareness of clinical trials. Uh, is, is this something you think is, is worthwhile? Is this something we should be involved in? Yeah, I mean, it, before COVID, um, NHSX um, pulled lots of uh, patient organisations, so all of the cancer charities together uh, and some other people to explore how we could use digital and potentially um, uh, apps uh, to um, make cancer patients more aware of clinical trials. I think they were looking at it beyond cancer um, but um, uh, as well, but uh, I, I was part of that group and obviously I think a lot of things have been uh, paused with, with COVID, but I absolutely think, it, you know, we've got to use every medium possible. Um, uh, you know, so if people aren't uh, being made aware of trials when they're going through their consultations, um, if they can't find anything online, there needs to be uh, other ways that they can uh, find out about clinical trials. And obviously, some of the cancer charities have really good information on their website, like um, Cancer Research UK. But I think we've got to explore every avenue to uh, kind of uh, bring it to the fore so people can see it and ask the right questions. Mm. Thank you. Um, a, a question I'm going to ask, and again, another question from the, from the audience, uh, Albert, and I'm going to ask you to comment on uh, whether there is a role for a collaboration such as ours, such as our partnership in the development of national guidelines in relation to biomarker testing. Uh, and then I, I will ask Dani and Carol then to comment on the second part of the question, which is who should be involved in that process? interesting to see how the, uh, the medical device um, regulation plays out or the uh, um, in vitro medical device, the IVDR, um, it's shortened to and obviously in the, in the post-Brexit world because um, at, at the moment there, there are differences between um, biomarker testing companies so that, that will certainly um, be an interesting area over the next few years um, but from, um, from a kind of a, a a patient and um, specialist point of view. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave that for, for Carol and, and Dane to, uh, uh, to speak about. <laughs> so I, I guess the, the development of national guidelines has generally been left to the great and the good in, in very specific groups. So I, I wonder whether the, the question to us is whether our kind of partnership of, of bringing in all the stakeholders is perhaps an alternative place for the development of guidelines. Uh, what do you think about that, Dani? I, I think with um, uh, genomics and um, biomarker testing, we, all, all of the sectors have to work together. So, I mean, they, we are, there are, there's obviously in the UK um, and in, in England there's a national strategy and I'm pretty sure that the uh, other nations are not too far behind. Um, and there is a national clinical lead in England to work across all of the Royal Colleges. So I think there is, and I have seen that some um, other organisations like the um, British Society uh, of Onco uh, Gynae Oncology, I was involved in some forums where they developed some consensus around how they would um, uh, test um, uh, uh, for BRCA, etc., so that they didn't have variation in their practice. So we're already seeing that sort of thing happen. M my sense is, is that the private sector, um, uh, industry, and the healthcare sector, and, and organisations and associations need to work together. We need to somehow uh, uh, align it um, uh, to enable consistency, I think, and reduce variation. That answers your question. That's just my view. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Carol, do you have so, a thought on that? Uh, so I think the politics of the situation is that patients demand it, they see the benefit, they go to the politicians who then ask for it to be done. And we've seen it with Herceptin, we've seen it with breast screening, <laughs> we've seen it with all sorts of things in my, my career. And I think we'll see it with this. 
it, you know, it's, it's on the cusp of being something that's almost demand led by patients. And uh, it doesn't matter which system it is, it's a matter of accumulating data and collecting it in a way that benefits patients now, but at the same time benefits future patients for the next generation. And I think in that way, uh, people will fund it because they'll realize whether it's private insurance, whether it's a tax-based health system such as the NHS, at the end of the day, it's the only way you'll get more benefit from less money by s targeting the right drug to the right patient. That seems such a logical approach to it that it can only be a winner. And after all, we know from a biological viewpoint that the behavior of a cancer cell is explained in its genome. I mean, it's got to be. It, there's no other mechanism. That's its genetic imprint. That's telling it what to do. And uh, if we only understood how to unlock the key, we're in business. And uh, we've, we're, we're so nearly there now. Uh, I think it will be exciting to see how this project unfolds. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So in the last couple of minutes, I did ask our panelists uh, a couple of weeks ago now, so they may have forgotten. Hopefully this won't be too much of a surprise. But I did ask everyone to come up with, with a couple of short sentences around where they would like to see biomarker testing in cancer in about two years' time. So can we start with you, Janie? Thank you. And Albert? Yeah, so to, to build on that, certainly embedded. Um, my, my idea and um, be interested to, to understand Carol's take on this was, was to have um, a, um, a kind of a decision tree or a, a rules-based system where a patient mm -hmm. would um, uh, present with a certain um, phenotype and genotype and on the basis of the test results would then go down um, a, a treatment pathway and the, the obvious uh, biomarker test uh, would be available. Uh, listening to Carol speak earlier about the um, about kind of testing everything from, from a patient, that that, um, that that might not uh, play out in uh, in in his uh, view. <laughs> well. Thank you, and I'll hand that over to Carol then for comment. <laughs> you know, what I find amazing is that with the COVID era, everybody has PCR. Everyone knows, even my grandchildren, six-year-olds, know what a PCR is now. They can tell you all about it. So all that technology was driven over a six-month period by the pandemic. So what we're going to see now, I'm sure, is an abundance of genetic information from virology spill over into cancer. People are going to connect the two and say all that drive to have all these labs everywhere. I do a test once a week. You probably do a test once a week, Phil. And uh, moving forward, we just need to adapt it to a different world, a different world of cancer, eukaryotic cells rather than viral genomes hanging in there. So I think the future is great for this whole field. Thank you. So good words to end on, I think. So I'd like to thank our panelists for an engaging and interesting discussion this evening. I'd like to thank Rutherford particularly for uh, lending us the location for myself and Carol and our IT team to uh, lead the discussions. Uh, and also to thank Rutherford for providing the venue for the video that hopefully you saw as you logged in this evening. If you haven't seen that, the Reflections film, then I would recommend that, um, that you take a look at that on the website. So the next, we, we, and we will show it, I think, as a, as a play out today as well, if you want to stick around and have a look. So going right back to the beginning, this evening was the launch of our Molecular Diagnostic Innovation Partnership. If anything you have heard this evening has resonated with your practice, then please sign up and you'll be receiving an email uh, after the meeting. Please also give us some feedback to say how much you've enjoyed our discussions. And actually, if there are things that you see as barriers in your practice that we've not discussed this evening, then really, you really need to be signing up. We, we don't think we have all the answers yet. And what we're wanting to create with the, it, with the MDIP is not necessarily the solutions, but is an environment in which we can find the solutions. We can bring to make that connectivity and actually move the field forward. So our next event that we're planning will be a conference in the middle of next year. We're hoping that will be real life, so we're hoping to actually see you there in person. And the stars of the conference will be 
yourselves. So what we're going to be doing is making a call for abstracts for people to tell us about the barriers that they see in their practice to biomarker testing and the solutions that they're coming up with. And we'll then be bringing people together sometime in the middle of next year when, if the world is back to normal, to, to, to share those findings with us, to share the solutions, to share the problems, so that we can begin to actually deal with these problems together and find pathways together. So thank you all for joining. Thank you again to our panelists. And that's good night from myself and Carol in London and from Danny and Albert. <laughs>